For muscle growth, training to failure is beneficial. However, for strength, training to failure might be making you weaker. Welcome back, Dr. Milo Wolf here today with Wolf Coaching, and today we're talking about training to failure for strength and why it's probably not beneficial. First off, let me set the scene for you. Robinson and colleagues published a meta-analysis on the effects of how close to failure you train and how beneficial a given set is for strength improvements. Basically, here's what they found. They found that when a set had a given load, a certain percentage of winner max, whether you went closer to failure or trained further from failure, how much strength you gained from that set didn't actually change. In fact, if you look closely, you might see that as you went really close to failure, say within one rep of failure, for example, you actually saw worse strength gains. And by strength gains, I mean improvements in your one rep max. So for example, how much can you squat, bench, or deadlift for one rep? Now you might be saying, wait a minute, if this is when load was matched, what about when you go closer to failure? For example, you do a singlet RP8 with two reps on the tank versus doing a singlet RP5 with five reps on the tank, right? If you're doing a single at RP8, you'll be able to lose a lot more weight than you would be if you did a single at RP5. And therefore, what about how RP influences load? What if by going closer to failure, you're able to lift more weight? Indeed, if you look at this meta-analysis by Swinton and colleagues, you'll see that generally, the heavier you train in terms of percentage of one or max, the more strength gains you'll see from a given set. This is where a study by Robinson and colleagues, again, same authors, it's like all they do is research RPE and training to failure, comes in. In this study, there were four groups. Group one trained on average on the squat and bench press to an RPE of four to six, which means four to six repetitions in reserve on any given set. The second group trained to an RPE of seven to nine. The third group trained to an RPE of seven to nine, but took the last set every time they trained to failure. Finally, the fourth group trained to an RP10 every time they trained. So every set was taken to concentric failure where they actually failed a rep. As I mentioned, they used the squat and bench press in this intervention. They also did some accessory upper body work. There's some shoulder pressing, some lat pull downs, some curls, some triceps, but the RP was kept the same for all of these. As far as the squat and bench press went, the participants in all groups performed 10 sets per week. Importantly, the authors made sure that the groups were actually training at the intended RPE or intended proximity to failure by cross-validating what their RPE was supposed to be with the velocity with which they were able to lift the weight on any given rep on that set. And what turned out to be the case is that the group who was trying to train to 4 to 6 RPE, aka 4 to 6 reps in reserve, was actually training closer to a 2 RPE, so actually 8 repetitions in reserve. So, when we're interpreting the results, keep that in mind. And well, here are the results. In terms of strength gains on the squat and bench press 1 rep max, the 4 to 6 RPE group, the group training 8 reps away from failure, and the 7 to 9 RPE group generally saw the best results. When you compare these two groups to the 7 to 9 RPE group that also took the last set to failure, and the group that took every set to failure, the 10 RP group, they made substantially better gains. If you look very closely, you'll see that the 7 to 9 RP group technically made the best gains, but the gains were comparable between the 4 to 6 RP group, who trained a whopping 8 reps away from failure, and the 7 to 9 RP group. Importantly, the higher RP groups, the 7 to 9 plus RP group, and the 10 RP group, actually had heavier loads during training. So if you look at the average percentage of one max they used during training, it was actually meaningfully higher than the lower RP groups. In spite of this, the lower RP groups actually saw better strength gains. Why? Well, as the authors put forth, it might be due to specificity. When you go closer to failure on a given set, especially a higher rep set, what happens is that from the first rep to the last rep, your force output will drop meaningfully. And so, by the time you get to those last few hard, close to failure reps, your force output will be substantially lower than it was at the start of the set. Importantly, this might make training less specific. When you think about a one rep max, what happens? Well, by definition, it's a one rep max. So you're exerting as much force as you humanly can. And so, when you get to those last few reps on a hard, close to failure set, the force production on those reps may simply not be very specific to your outcome anymore. And you know how the saying goes, practice how you mean to play. And so, because the practice became less specific, it might be that that's why the lower RPA groups that have higher force output and less of a drop off throughout each set saw better strength gains. And this actually seemed to have a bigger influence than the exact percentage of one rep max that was being used by different participants. And ultimately, to an extent, that kind of makes sense. When you're training for strength, your body doesn't really know what weight is on the bar. All it really knows is how much force you're producing in order to overcome gravity. So a big takeaway here is lift explosively when you're training for strength. 
On the concentric phase, you should be aiming to lift the bar as quickly as possible. Importantly, these results applied when sets and reps were matched between different groups. Now, in practice, that's rarely the case. If you're training at a lower RPE, keeping your sets more so maximal, that will generally cause less fatigue, and therefore you can do more sets and more reps. And so, even when sets and reps are matched, you see better strength gains when training at a lower RPE. However, in practice, this might be even more so the case, because by training at a lower RPE, you're able to do more sets across the week, and thus this meta-analysis by Ralston and colleagues showed that is generally going to lead to greater strength improvements. Interestingly though, this study also measured fatigue. Initially within the study, the higher RPE groups, specifically the 10 RPE group, did experience slightly higher psychological fatigue. Specifically, they felt like they were less well recovered, and they also felt as though each session was more challenging. However, while this was the case initially, this quickly got better over the course of the study. By the end of the study, there weren't really any major differences between the groups anymore in terms of either how hard they found each session or in terms of how recovered they felt. Interestingly, physiologically, in terms of two enzymes we used to measure fatigue, creatine kinase and lactate dehydrogenase, there were no differences between the groups. Importantly though, when you look at the wider field of evidence, it does seem like that the closer to failure you train, the more fatiguing a given set will be. Now, I do think this effect on fatigue attenuates over time. So if you've been training to failure for a while, you might not see such a big difference anymore. So it seems like high RPEs for strength are kind of all bad news, right? You get seemingly worse strength gains when sets and reps are equated for, and in fact, by training at lower RPE, you're typically able to do more sets, which will then lead to more strength gains. However, when might you actually want to train at higher RPEs for strength? I think there are about three cases in which you might want to consider training at pretty high RPE. The first one is when you're very close to a competition or to a max out. The skill of grinding out a heavy weight might be something that you do need to eventually practice. It's probably not something you need to spend the whole year practicing for, but doing at least a few heavy singles close to competition to practice that skill of grinding out a heavy rep where you might end up slightly out of position at times, that is a very useful skill to build up to. The second situation might be far out from a competition. When you're trying to maximize hypertrophy, as I've discussed in this video here, the closer to failure you train, generally the more effective a set will become for hypertrophy. So if you're trying to maximize muscle growth, build up some size in those prime movers in say the squat, bench, and deadlift, then training closer to failure during those phases where you're far away from the competition and the additional fatigue or direct strength improvement doesn't matter as much might be a wise move. Finally, the one place in your program where I would generally be okay with going a bit higher in terms of RPEs, maybe all the way up to an eight or nine typically, is for heavier work. Because of the relationship between how many reps you can do and the percentage of one at max, Generally, you'll see the greatest improvement in how much load you can have on the bar with low rep sets. So if, for example, your program calls for a single and then back off sets of five, I would generally recommend having a higher RPE on that single versus the back off sets. By going closer to failure on that single, you're able to load the bar substantially more than you would be able to if you went higher in terms of RPE on the back down sets. So let me summarize this video. Training closer to failure does not improve your strength gains. In fact, there's a good chance that it might make it worse, even when sets and reps are matched. However, more importantly, in practice, when you train more submaximally, you're typically able to do more sets. Therefore, training more submaximally is generally going to be superior for strength gains. I would keep most of your training between RPEs of about three to eight for strength. Closer to competition, when you're trying to practice that skill of grinding out a lift. Far away from a competition, when you're trying to maximize hypertrophy potentially. This is where I would potentially go higher in terms of RPE and maybe go all the way to failure. Now that's the video. If you enjoyed the video, please consider commenting, liking, subscribing. Let me know if there's anything else you want to see. And I'll see you guys, my subscribers, in that next one. Peace.